All right. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. This is the Zen Framework uh, 3 status update hangout. We're going to probably be doing these somewhat um, regularly uh, from here forward. This one will probably be um, a bit more informative and lengthy than um, most of them are. But uh, we hope you enjoy it and um, would appreciate any feedback. Gary, um, who is somewhere down there, I don't know where he actually lines up um, in the list, is going to be um, kind of hosting this whole thing. If you are watching from the Hangout site, you should have a Q&A panel on the left, or on the right, sorry. Um, if you're signed into Google, that'll actually let you go ahead and uh, ask questions and stuff. Um, it's not a chat, it's, it's just kind of a Q&A panel. Um, so go ahead and uh, if you have any questions that you want to see answered during this, you can ask them there and you can um, plus one vote them up and we'll see them and maybe if we have some time we'll get through those questions. So um, I'll get, I'm going to hand it off to Gary and um, Gary you can go ahead and do uh, introductions and um, we'll go from there. Hey everyone, so um, just a quick a roundup of what this Hangout is entitled to be. So. What this Hangout is, is a very informal um, discussion, roundtable discussion, about Zen Framework 3. This isn't meant to be a decision-making process. It's not meant to be something where decisions are made or, or views are given. It's just meant to be a very informal Q&A with some of the members of the um, contributing team um, about what Zen Framework will be, may be, may not be, and when we can expect to, to see any developments on it. It's designed to inspire people and excite people, not to answer any of the technical questions, basically. So, in today's Hangout, we've got, from left to right on my screen, um, Ben Scholten, who's software architect at Rome, who's um, been a long-time contributor to Zen Framework 1 and Zen Framework 2. And I believe you wrote the router, router for my American friends for Zen Framework 2, Ben? Um, yes. That's correct, yeah. We've got uh, Evan, who just introduced himself. Again, long-term contributor, one and two, and author of the module manager that so elegantly makes Emperor with two hang together. And we've got um, Marco, Marco Pavetta, who's a long-term contributor to one and two, um, a big contributor to the Doctrine pro Project, um, author or principal author with help Marco of uh, Doctrine or M module. Um, and uh, proxy lever, and of course everybody should know at this point Matthew Weirafini, project lead, Zen Framework, um, and the guy who enables all this great stuff to happen. So that's the team today. Um, I guess I'll kick off with um, an easy question to whoever wants to pick this one up to start with. Um, sorry, before we start, if you do have any questions for the guys, please use the chat box, uh, please use the Q&A panel on the right-hand side. If you ask interesting questions on there, then I'll, I'll pass them on to the team on your behalf and we'll get them answered. Um, there's also some chat going on in uh, the IRC channel, which is zftalk.dev on Freenode. Um, and I'll also take questions from, from that location as well if you're un, un, uh, unaware of how to use the Hangout. So, guys, let's ask the first question. Um, why? Why do we need Zen Framework 3? Anyone going to run with that one? Matthew? Matthew, you're the default. <laughs> okay, can you guys hear me at this point? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. I uh, thought I unmuted, but it's hard to see the little bars. I have that window kind of s small so I can actually see the uh, IRC as well as Twitter to see what questions come in. Uh, yeah, why do we need a ZF3? Uh, that's a good question, and actually uh, we did a um, an offsite, my team and I, in uh, June, and at the time uh, we weren't quite sure what uh, feature would uh, really precipitate a ZF3, what would we really want to do. Uh, one of the pieces, of course, uh, that we've been bringing up is raising the minimum required PHP version. I actually uh, started a thread yesterday asking if perhaps we need to up it uh, within the uh, 2 series uh, simply because there's a number of things that we cannot do right now. Uh, we're limited on some of the decisions we can make. Um, so that's one of the questions, you know, that's one of the pieces that we might 
want to answer if uh, we want to go to set of three is what do PHP minimum version do we want to adopt at that point. Uh, other pieces in terms of features are, are performance and there are a few things where upping the PHP version allows us to make use of PHP features that uh, aren't available to us in 5.3.3 that will then make it possible for us to do more things. Um, in particular, performance improvements that we can make in the service manager and the event manager uh, by making better use of PHP capabilities that have evolved since we originally wrote them. So those are some of the pieces we're looking at. Uh, you'll notice I'm not talking about a rewrite. Um, unlike ZF2, we're not talking about rewriting the entire MVC and everything. We're talking about a very much an incremental evolution. Um, but at the same time, with minor, uh, with major up uh, versions, we do have the ability to break backwards compatibility. And the reasons we would do that would be, again, if uh, breaking backwards compatibility is necessary in order to get the sorts of improvements we need, that's what we would do. Um, but one of the big features that we're looking at is we want to have a very incremental improvement so that people are not uh, at the point where they are with ZF1 and ZF2 where people are just not necessarily switching because they've got so much infrastructure and the migration is so hard. We don't want to have that same story with uh, with three. So that's the default answer, uh, you know, incremental upgrades that require some breakages, uh, but I'm sure some people here might have uh, other things. Uh, Evan, you were going to say something, I think. Um, yeah, I, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. I, I I think that it's important to stress that the, the whole um, situation from Zen Framework 1 to Zen Framework 2 um, was a necessary evil, um, in a sense. We, we really needed to take that step to improve the, um, the architecture of Zen Framework as a whole, and it wasn't a decision that we made lightly to make it um, such a drastic change, and um, because of um, those changes that we made from Zen Framework 1 to Zen Framework 2, um, the result of that is that um, Zen Framework 3 will not be so drastic because we've we've put in place a lot of foundational stuff that is going to um, you know make the framework a lot more future proof moving forward. It's um, going to be um, much more subtle changes um, and iterative uh, improvements uh, from here on out. So you don't really have to be scared of Zen Framework 3. A lot of people, their biggest reaction is like, Zen Framework 3, like we haven't even upgraded to 2 yet. Like what the, oh crap, you know. But, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not like that. So um, that's, that's pretty much all I would add. I, I, I think it's a necessary um, um, thing, just like you said, to, to break backwards compatibility every once in a while. Um, we need to do that. And um, that's that's why we have major version numbers. Okay, so does anyone else want to, Marco, uh, Ben, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, if I can add something. Um, I wanted to, to also clarify that it won't be uh, that smooth on every edge. Uh, we will have breakages uh, in the upgrade. And it will be mainly related to the fact that we are working. We will probably be working uh, on some components that were rushed in while developing Zen Framework 2, or that maybe we noticed that actually have some changes that are required. And so there will be breakages. So um, it's just that we won't have like a complete rewrite, or we don't have like to have you change every bit of your applications. So you will still experience some breakages, but it's uh, it's for good. So we are removing pieces that were rushed in or pieces that don't work like it should be. And that's all for me. Yeah, and uh, as Marco has noted, uh, there were quite a few things which were rushed in in Zen Framework 2, um, which I myself especially noted about the router when uh, people came with new use cases, and we ended up with the same situation as in Zen Framework 1, where we had to hack around the architecture instead of making the architecture the way it should be to properly support the use cases. So that's clearly something we want to clean up with Zen Framework 3. Cool. So, following on from that, um, what PHP version does the panel estimate that Zen Framework 3 will be targeting at this point? That's a really hard one, actually. I, <laughs> I, there's a lot of religious wars that go on about this. There are those who say, you know, do whatever, go, you know, the latest stable versions on the latest uh, long release 
long-term service versions of uh, distros are doing. Uh, one of the problems with that is that uh, I, Evan, I think, was the one who noted this on the thread yesterday. If you are buying into that sort of life cycle, usually you are buying into pinning to specific versions of the framework, specific versions of every tool you do, and you only upgrade uh, on these major life cycles, usually measured in years. Uh, so that makes it harder for us to say, you know, we're going to say we want to do it on the specific version, because if we go with the uh, version that's shipping with long-term distros, quite often those are out of date by the time we even release. Uh, as a perfect example, 5.3.3, while that was the stable version when we were uh, setting it to everything up, even by the time we released, Red Hat and others were starting to offer more recent versions of PHP even at that point, even though some of the older versions of Red Hat and CentOS are using 5.3.3 still. Um, so it becomes a very difficult question. It becomes tricky. One of the things with me as working at Zend, of course, is Zen Server supports 5.4 now, so we could make a decision today to say 5.4, we know it works on basically every platform people are going to be using. They can install Zen Server and have an up-to-date PHP runtime if they want to. Of course, not everybody wants to buy uh, Zen Server in order to do it, although there is a community version. It's very capable. It just has some of the features dialed down. Um, so that's one of the things I look at is, you know, we could adopt whatever feature, you know, whatever versions uh, Zen Server supports at this day and age. I personally would like to see at least a minimum version of 5.4. There are some important features that would really streamline our code. We have a lot of these aware interfaces that are basically composing in specific types of objects, like the service manager, the event manager, uh, and other things. It'd be really nice to be able to use traits in order to do the composition instead of having a lot of duplicated code everywhere. Uh, so that's one of the pieces that I would love to see is the usage of traits. Honestly, I'd love to go to 5.5 and make use of some of the uh, features such as generators because I think they would also help speed up some of the um, features, especially the event manager, if we had that sort of capability. Right now, we don't. Um, question, though, of course, is adoption. 5.5 has maybe a fraction of a percent of adoption uh, of all the PHP versions right now. Um, I think I've seen some generous ones say 2%, but I doubt it's even that at this point. Uh, 5.4 got hardly any adoption. Uh, there's still a lot of people on 5.3, even though officially it's considered end of life. Uh, I'm not even sure they're getting security patches at this point. So what version do we go to? I'd say minimally we want to go to 5.4. Which version of 5.4 is something that we need to decide? Yeah. Cool. So does anyone else have any any input to add on, on versions? Of, or will this be one of those decisions that is ultimately in Matthew's hands anyway? So. Nobody else needs to give any opinion. Well, um, I, I was just going to say real quick that uh, my opinion is pretty well, actually, even though it, it's technically about a different topic, um, there's a thread on the mailing list um, that was posted yesterday, and I pretty much posted my my opinion on, on looking at PHP version numbers and how that should be tied to the framework and stuff. Um, and basically, it's it's what Matthew said, the, the argument of, what the major distributions um, support is is a valid argument, but at the same time, those um, people that uh, use those distributions have bought into, um, you know, using uh, kind of stale versions that only have security fixes backported. So I think that if we follow that pattern, um, we can kind of make some decisions to support newer PHP versions and and just still you know backport security fixes to those that are stuck on on other versions, but. I'll, I'll let Marco uh, chime in. Yeah, yeah. so uh, as you have seen, there's basically a discussion on the mailing list for those who follow it. Uh, it's the development uh, slash contributors uh, mailing list of Zen Framework. Um, there's just the point that I would like to bring up. And while it is pretty much clear that 5.4 is being a minimum for Zen Framework, Three, um, the minor version still has to be decided. So that will probably be an average of what the long-term support um, releases of Linux uh, will support in future. Um, I just suggest that we uh, bring up 5.4 latest, which is a good pattern, but that still has to be decided on a thread. So um, yeah, that's it for me. It's just an opinion. Ben, anything to add, or are you happy to go along to get along? Uh, nothing to add from my side. Cool. So let's let's um, 
let's move on to some of the questions that um, people have been asking. On the apparently that's the side where the questions are because everything's reversed in Google Hangouts. So the questions over here. Um, so let's have a look here. It's very difficult for me to see who owns this question. I presume this is from um, from Kyle Spraggs from Spiffy, um, and he asks a question which is to do with the, um, the the tight coupling of components in ZF2. So is there any um, idea in ZF3 to um, decouple the components um, more than they already are. Um, ideally, all the components should be able to be cloned, composer installed, and immediately unit tested. All suggestions, comments. Okay, so I'll uh, answer a couple things. You can already uh, com compose or install any component uh, along with the various uh, uh, dependencies that they have. We've had this feature for a long time. Um, the question that uh, is more interesting here is whether they should include the tests. Right now we have a process that goes and uh, essentially takes a library portion of um, of Zen Framework, goes through each of the component, slices it up, and goes and pushes out the changes to these individual component repositories. So it's completely automated. As a result, they don't include the tests. Uh, and uh, in large part because for us to do this actually requires a whole lot of work to go and separate them out into their own repositories, bring in the tests, uh, make sure all the composer dependencies work. Uh, there's actually a lot of work that happens with this. Uh, I would expect several days for most components and sometimes up to upwards of a week in some of the harder components. So how do we take care of that? Um, that's a, that's a hard one. I'm not sure that there's a huge amount of gain to be had for the tests to be available within the individual components. Most of the people who are installing via Composer are not running the tests that they install that way. They are simply installing the dependency that they want to use, in which case we want to have as slim of a package as possible. We want them to be able to just install the package and use it. That's what Composer is for. If they want to get the tests, that's what we have the full repository for. Um, I don't know. I Personally, I don't see any huge benefit to doing it that way, but I'm curious to see if anybody else on the panel has uh, thoughts there. Well, we actually it seems uh, like a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, we we actually just had uh, we we have a company hangout that that we do um, daily, and Ben and I were actually just discussing this uh, the other day, and um, basically the conclusion that I came to is that there are. Um, I can think of a lot of downsides to doing it. There's there's a lot of more overhead of splitting um, everything out and and maintaining it separately and stuff like that. And I really just have not been able to think of enough uh, upsides to actually um, you know weigh it out and and make it you, you, uh, worth the the trouble actually. So. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that there aren't enough positive uh, aspects of splitting them up. I just I don't know what they are. Um, I haven't uh, thought of them. Nobody has actually pointed out any real um, positive gains that we would get from splitting out the components. So um, I'm just I'm not sold on the idea yet. But I'm I'm completely open to it if somebody um, can actually sell me on the idea and, and convince me that there are some benefits there. Yeah, if I may add something, um, the problem so far with with decoupling the components is that the components actually provide bridges between each other. So uh, either we identify the bridges between the components and move them themselves to different components. Is anybody just, else uh, hearing Marco? No, no, we just just, uh, sorry, my mic just snapped. Um, so basically, uh, Symfony already uh, does this for some external dependencies that they use, but the internal components of the framework are all tested together. And I think it makes sense to keep it that way. Uh, what people are really worrying about is like installing something like the input filter component and getting like seven, eight dependencies and an internationalization component and so on. So that's really confusing for some people, but that's because there's some glue components in each of these parts of the framework. And that's really hard to decouple because they actually are the glue between different uh, parts of the framework. Um, well, about the uh, internal internationalization you mentioned, uh, we actually already started in Zen Framework 2 to separate that a little from the uh, Zen validator component. 
by making this uh, an, a specific interface within the component, and we have the glue layer within Zen MVC for that. Um, so this also allows to use the validator with a translator from another uh, framework like Symfony or such. And yeah, we want to enhance on that uh, certainly. Uh, even possible still in Zen framework too, but that uh, yeah is a requirement that we actually upper the PHP version, so that's actually doable. Cool. So um, taking another question from uh, from the hangout. Um, Franz de Leon asks, what are the major changes improvements from, from 2 to 3, which I guess is some, somehow difficult to answer given that we don't know the answer to that question yet, but what would you envisage being the, you know, the major changes and improvements? Where generally would you see that these areas exist for changes and improvements? Actually, Marco can probably answer that better than anybody. I know he's been working on some uh, PRs with um, uh, Mikael Galejo, so uh, why don't you take that one? Yeah, let me pick just a second. Let me see if I can share a screen about this. I think this is it. Yeah, that's it. So basically, uh, what we have, if you search in GitHub for Zen Framework 3, for ZF3 in the repository of Zen Framework 2, you get a lot of new uh, ideas. There's actually uh, 35 open issues about that. Um, there's some ideas that will probably uh, be new features and mainly making the service manager, uh, manager immutable to allow uh, some performance improvements and some safety. Um, there's uh, work going on on the input filters to uh, get them also immutable so that you can reuse a filter more and more uh, more and more times uh, without worrying about recycling um, the same instance or different, for example, forms. Um, that allows us to save memory, instantiation uh, time, performance. Uh, there's an idea of getting started on a transformer component, which is still a bit, it is still just an idea, but what it would allow us is to uh, complement the, uh, the the differences that are required in data coming from an input filter and in data that you um, want to put in an object, and that's basically the job of a serializer if you think about it. But that will be something that we still miss. Uh, ben has been mentioning something about the new router um, logic, which he will probably reveal at ZenCon this year, uh, ZenCon Europe. Um, and there's um, other minor ideas. For example, the hydrator component will probably become, become a first-class citizen of the framework, being used more and more across components. So there's a lot going on. Um, and we're also collecting a lot of new ideas on Google Moderator, and I'll eventually bring up the link, um, bring up the link, and maybe we'll post it uh, on the on the YouTube video that is being recorded. So I hope that makes up for the question. I have a question for Ben regarding this: Is the new router going to be backwards compatible? I really don't want to rewrite all my routes. Um, yeah, that may be a little problem because uh, it's pretty much about really simplifying the entire architecture uh, and the especially the configuration of routes, um, and that will not easily be backward compatible. Do you have uh, any plans for like a compatibility layer so that the old routes can be somehow translated to the new routing system so that people don't have to update everything all at once? Um, that may actually work for normal routes, uh, so the, all the path routes, but um, all the special things like hostname, schema routes, and such will not that easily be convertible. Okay, I was just curious, and we hadn't asked or talked about that yet. So, cool. So, um, I guess um, another question. Um, this question comes from, sorry, I can't actually see on my screen who's asking the question. It's from um, from uh, James Titcombe, um, and the question is, how long will ZF2 be supported for? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, with, uh, with Zen Framework 1, uh, what we had said was 18 to 24 months after a stable release of Zen Framework 2. 
I think we can say similarly for Zen Framework uh, 3 uh, and going into 2 is that we can say 18 to 24 months after a stable release of Zen Framework 3. That said, the, the, what we have taken um, for development for Zen Framework 1 is mainly a maintenance uh, point of view. So once we had a stable version of Zen Framework 2 out, maintenance, uh, Zen Framework 1 ba basically went into maintenance mode. We're mo mostly doing bug fixes at this point uh, and security fixes. And so whatever the minor version is of 2.x uh, whenever we get to 3 is probably going to be the last minor version that we do with uh, maintenance releases going forward from there. Uh, the reason being it's really, really hard to have multiple branches of development going on simultaneously. So the quicker we can, uh, the the sooner we can say this is maintenance only, the better, which is why I like to lock it down when we go stable. Cool. There must be a lag here. I see people nodding Sorry. still. <laughs> I, I, was, I was frantically trying to unmute my microphone, Matthew. I don't, I'm sorry. I was that huge button to unmute my microphone. Um, okay, cool. So um, another question, I guess this will be uh, better answered by uh, by Evan, um, and it's by Franz de Leon, and it's will my ZF2 modules work in ZF3? <sighs> That's the big question. Um, <laughs> I can't promise anything right now, um, especially because a lot of that is going to be outside of the scope of the module manager. I will. I I can at least promise that I will do my best to make sure that the um, aspects of modules that are within control of the module manager component itself, um, all the various listeners and stuff, um, that they will either be compatible or very easy to make compatible. Um, there are some talks about things that we're going to change with configuration of services um, with uh, respect to how um, the non-cacheable uh, services such as factories that are closures and stuff are handled and um, if we go down that route, which I think it's pretty unanimous that we are going to go down that route, um, there will be really easy strategies, which I've actually outlined already in some comments on those pull requests, um, to maintain compatibility. So you can have a module that will work in Zen Framework 1 and Zen Framework 2, or I'm sorry, Zen Framework 2 and Zen Framework 3, um, without any problems. Uh, that said, now if Ben Scholzen, for example, makes a router, a new Zen Framework 3 router that's not compatible at all, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, and there's nothing that we can do about that if, if the new architecture of the new router requires some backwards compatibility breaks. So there might be certain aspects of your modules you might need to update. Um, what we should probably all keep in mind is um, not to make those features uh, overlap. So what I mean by that is it would be ideal if in my module I could provide Zen Framework 2 routes and Zen Framework 3 routes um, and just have them parallel. And that would, you know, make it so that I could have, instead of having two branches of a module, I could just have a module that's compatible with both versions. That would be my ideal situation. Um, that'll take some collaboration um, between the component maintainers to make sure that we kind of think about that in all aspects. But that would be, be my goal, at least. Cool. Um, so I'll keep picking off the questions from the right-hand side. Um, We've got plenty of time. Uh, so a question here from uh, Whittold. Any plans to create a roadmap um, like Symphony have? Basically, he's included a link on the right-hand side to the Symphony's um, uh, release schedule page. Is there any plans for, I guess, more structured um, roadmap and milestones in the upcoming releases to, I guess, 1, 2, and 3? Yeah. So that requires us making decisions about what we're actually going to do for ZF3. Uh, so <laughs> that's the first step, is making those decisions. Once we have some decisions about exactly what features we want to accomplish, uh, what new features we want to do, what um, our refactors we want to, to accomplish, uh, and how we want to do those, then we can start coming up with the milestones. Personally, I really like uh, date-driven milestones. The problem, of course, with an open source project is uh, date-driven often gets uh, dumped out the window when people have paying work. So uh, that becomes a little bit harder. And that's you know, we were able to accomplish it for ZF2, uh, but primarily because uh, when we got to a certain point, my team just kind of took over. <laughs> and you know, that, that's both a good and a bad thing. It's good in that you know, way I do have a team that can uh, take on a lot of the development tasks, but it also means that there's less community voice at that point once we start doing that. Um, 
but yeah, I would really like to get the milestones up there once we have made those decisions, and that's the first step is making a decision on those. Cool, thanks. So um, we need a timeline for doing decisions. Uh, this is probably the next bit. Uh, and uh, to be honest, one of the I mentioned before the uh, offsite that my team did in June last year, and we were having trouble figuring out what would be something compelling that would make people want to do ZF3. Because right now, if we're looking at incremental update, ah, boring, right? So we actually switched gears at that point and started on the App Agility project. Uh, it wasn't called that at first, um, but that's the the name that everybody knows it by now. Um, and we started on that because that becomes a compelling story. Now, that one of the compelling pieces of that is that it actually gives us a roadmap for how we can make Zen Framework more approachable for end users because we can actually start saying, hey, here's an admin interface, go in and do this, and now just fill in this little bit of code. They don't have to understand the whole thing until they're ready to start doing the more advanced pieces. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, I'm looking at uh, in terms of what could we do for Zen Framework 3 is maybe some extensions to how App Agility works to make it more of a, a, a tool for the end users, have uh, some command line interfaces that they can use that also tie into the same uh, APIs that we're doing in App Agility in order to create the project, in order to start creating controllers and filling in things and dropping them into the code that they need to actually uh, do. I think that becomes a compelling story because frankly Zen Framework 2 adoption, part of the slowness for it has been people perceive it as much more complex than Zen Framework 1. They were used to being able to say, oh, I drop in a controller here, give it the you know, an action name, I'm done. Uh, and now they're like, oh, what's this module stuff? And then, oh, I have to follow this directive. What is all this? I'm, ah, and they don't want to hear it. Um, and so we want to make it easier for them. Uh, and yet at the same time, I think Zen Framework 2 has given us some architecture that makes it incredibly flexible and it'll obviously allows us to accomplish many more things than we're able to do in Zen Framework 1. I hit things every day where uh, an event manager is really the answer or having a, this a service manager is the answer because I can do substitutions. This stuff is fantastic and it's definitely the step forward, but how do we make that more approachable? And I really think that's what we need to grasp before we start doing these milestones, what we need to make decisions about what it is that will make it compelling to end users, and then we can start developing those features. Yeah, good answer. Um, so I guess um, a question. I guess here's a question for Mark uh, for Marco. Um, what do you think about joining Doctrine to Zen Framework? Now there's many modules that use ZenDB or Doctrine. How do you see the integration of of, of Doctrine and Zen Framework three? Okay, so um, Doctrine is pretty much integrated with Zen Framework uh, 2 already. Uh, it's just that there's no real official support for it, but as far as I got to work on different projects and helping out people, you see more and more adoption of it. The real problem with getting Doctrine officially supported is that the Doctrine team is mainly focused on, on Symfony, um, and the Zen Framework team is pretty much busy building, um, uh, I mean, the Zen Framework team in Doctrine itself, because there's a subsection, is pretty much uh, busy um, building other modules or integrating other stuff or even contributing to Zen Framework internals itself other than, I mean, paid work because we do this in our free time. Uh, so what would uh, be needed to, to get official support in it is probably um, is, is probably more contributions to the modules, uh, especially testing out new versions and so on. I don't think that we'll get to a version uh, of Zen Framework where, where Doctrine is a first-class citizen, and I personally wouldn't want to see that either, because I think Zen Framework 2 is great, especially because it's so decoupled from the rest. Um, and Doctrine comes as a module, so it's really easy to integrate, and it's been um, quite easy to use, uh, actually. So um, either we get more contributors or we get some sponsoring in the Doctrine project itself to help more on the Doctrine, uh, on the Doctrine Plus Zen Framework um, side of, of uh, the Doctrine project itself. Or uh, basically, this is where we are. So uh, we're actually already doing fine, I think there probably won't be a direct integration. There will be um, some more work on the APGility stuff, so that we have APGility plus Doctrine, but that's really up to me and uh, Michael Gallego, so we're going to discuss it at, 
at uh, Zencon Europe, and maybe you will want to join us and discuss it with us, or just tell us what are, what your ideas are about it. But yeah, so I would not integrate it directly in the framework. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let me see. There was a crack in little question down here. Uh, yeah, another one from from uh, Spiffy from Carl Spriggs from Matthew, I guess. Is ZF Campus intended to be the official version of ZF Commons? I can answer that as no, but I guess <laughs> no. They're, they're they are intended to be separate. Um, ZF Campus is stuff that we want to be able to maintain as part of uh, the framework team itself. Uh, so these are things that we're saying that we're going to officially maintain going forward. Set of Campus is a community project. I mean, not Set of Campus. Set of Commons is a community project uh, that is, you know, has its own governance uh, and has its own uh, maintenance life cycles. Uh, maintainers come and go as, as time goes by. Set of Campus is intended for official modules that the Zen Framework team will be maintaining. We'll be opening up maintenance to those two. Um, uh, a community review team. It may or may not be the same community review team that is doing the Zen Framework project itself. Um, we may elect different people. There seems to be some overlap of users, but uh, there's also uh, a different set of users that are uh, starting to gravitate towards App Agility uh, who would be potentially good candidates for helping maintain that as well. Uh, but that said, they will have a, a life cycle and a maintenance cycle that we will be sponsoring uh, from Zend itself. Okay, cool. So, um, Manuel asks, are there any components where you consider um, BC breaks to be non-negotiable? Either, yes, there'll definitely be BC breaks, or no, we can't possibly have a, a, a break in this component. Yeah, I honestly, I would love to say that we can say there can be no BC breaks anywhere, but at the same time, I can already see places where, you know, the, the design may have been great when we started, but uh, things change. You know, we've seen new uh, people using things differently. Um, what I'd really like to see going forward, though, is if there are going to be any BC breaks, that there be some sort of compatibility layer, so that you, we can upgrade people from ZF2 to ZF3. Things continue to work, and then they can opt into the new features and life cycles as they go. Um, that would be the the best of all worlds, as far as I'm concerned. The question is how we get there. Um, when we we're talking about routing earlier. Most of the routing that you do uh, within Zen Framework 2 is through configuration. So technically, we should be able to write some way of taking the, config the ZF2 configuration and uh, parsing that into a structure that can then uh, feed into the ZF3 configuration for routing. So that sort of thing we should be able to do. Same sort of thing with the event manager and the service manager. We should be able to have some sort of compatibility layer uh, sitting on top if need be so that people can have stuff work as need uh, as necessary. Um, most of the things that I'm seeing people gravitating towards in terms of uh, updates to ZF3, uh, event manager in terms of performance, service manager in terms of performance, uh, and what we're noticing is that there may need to be some BC breaks as to how we refer to the service names uh, so that we can make things faster. Uh, and then with forms and the input filter, some uh, changes to those to make them uh, in more decoupled uh, and uh, make them work in a better object graph so that they can be more performant as well. Um, that said, forms and um, uh, input filters are largely configuration driven as well. So those are things where we should be able to translate again uh, as we go forward. Cool. Marco, so, Marco, can you add anything to that? I'm curious. Yeah, well, um, it's Pretty much, um, I think that the major changes would probably be about input filters, validators, and forms, uh, which are all about moving data around, which is a huge deal. Uh, let's face it, forms are not nice. They have never been, and they probably will never be because it's a, it's a very hard uh, topic to solve. But we're moving more in the direction of API-driven development, where you try to maybe develop a form in the client side with like Angular, um, uh, for example, Ember.js, and so on. And then you just move data in and out from the API. So maybe we'll focus on moving input filter more up in the chain and making it more relevant. And um, I can see that there will be breakages there. So there's actually um, a 
uh, a wiki page on the framework itself, uh, which is called ZF30 backwards compatibility breaks, where all the current breaks are being documented. So you can check that. Um, and as Matthew said, um, there will be uh, actually uh, compatibility layers for people using all their features and that don't want to rewrite them for Zen Framework 3. So that's it for me. Um, yeah, I still have another point. Um, in the pa past few, uh, few months, I was working on uh, Bacon authentication, which was meant to be a replacement for Zen authentication. And I clearly want that to be in Zen Framework 3 because it uh, allows two and three factor authentication, which is currently not really possible with the count authentication layer, which was basically taken from Zen Framework 1 and, well, you put the namespace label on it and that was it. So uh, there is a very huge architecture change and I don't think that we'll be able to supply any kind of compatibility layer there, especially because Zen Framework 2 didn't have any interface for the authenticator. Cool. So you're basically rewriting the authentication layer entirely. Uh, I already have. I just need to port it to the Zen frame, uh, Zen okay. namespace, but it's already done, and it can actually already be used in Zen framework too. Something to point out about stuff like that, though, is that because you can um, actually um, use individual components using Composer and stuff. You could, um, in theory, upgrade to Zen Framework 3, um, but then pull in Zen Framework 2's um, Zen authentication package and still consume that. So if, you know, there's there's also ways that you will be able to, that we didn't have in the past, you'll be able to kind of work around backwards compatibility breaks in a, in a sense. Um, it may not be a perfect process, but at least those mechanisms exist now, whereas before the, we didn't even have uh, any choices like that. So I just thought that's that's worth mentioning. Yeah, there's another point, and the fact is that not many people are rewriting their own authentication themselves, and I would not even suggest them to do so. Uh, so many people don't even use send authentication directly, but rely on a module like, for example, the CFC user. Uh, so what would what could happen is that we just upgrade that one to support the new authentication uh, layer and act as a facade, so you don't. Uh, worry about upgrading, so you just upgrade the module and you got the authentication working, so that's a huge deal. This is uh, something that we've been uh, working with with App Agility as well with authentication and authorization is that we're actually defining our own interfaces for those, uh, which allows us then we can plug in the authentication on authorization systems as needed. Uh, so exactly that, uh, that point that you're making there is that uh, as you upgrade, you can choose which one you want to use. And if I want to use the ZF2 version, I can use that. If I want to use the ZF3, I can use that as well. Uh, and that gives you a huge amount of flexibility. Uh, and this is a point that uh, I think is really interesting as well, and it's one that I'd like to, uh, direction I'd like us to go with ZF3, and we've started with uh, ZF2, is the idea of segregated interfaces, where the components define the interfaces that they're going to consume. If you do the same thing within your own code as well, that means that you create a bridge to the to the library that you want to use. And if that ends up being ZF2, great. If it ends up being ZF3, you can do that as well. Your interface hasn't changed. You're just using a different implementation of that interface. And that makes it uh, incredibly flexible in terms of upgrading. Great. So, I mean, it sounds like um, an upgrade from Zen Framework 2 to Zen Framework 3 should very much be possible to be done using a kind of strangler approach where you can replace parts of an existing application with the Zen Framework 3 components or not, as the case may be. So I hope that answers the questions to the people who are asking. Um, and also um, the question about doctrine has also been answered. Evan, if you can mark that as right now. Anyone skip into that question? using the cool Google Hangouts feature needs to go back about 20 minutes, so sorry. Um, I guess that, I mean, it's the elephant in the room. Um, I don't know whether that's a good pun or a bad pun, but I guess the questions regarding the documentation really should be asked. So um, there's a couple of questions. Um, one from Timo asking, uh, will there be better doc documentation with more examples from the real world? And another question, um, can you do two questions at a time, Evan, or do I need to be? <laughs> no, you can't. OK. And then the, you'll have to like put one has been answered halfway through this. And the other question is, 
um, why you know the suggestion is to create a best practices section in the docs um, with things like why not using the service locator in where interface inside the controller is such a good idea. I mean, I guess that's specifically related to Zen from Work 2 rather than a kind of 2 to 3 um, or Zen from Work 3 development question. But um, I guess covering improvements to the documentation wouldn't be a bad thing at this point. I'm going to address the elephant in the room is who's going to write it is what it comes down to. Um, and I, I'm not trying to be snarky about this, but the problem is that we've got a lot of people working on the development. And you know, I try and spend time writing documentation. I write uh, tutorials when I can. And I've written actually quite a number of them for Zen Framework 2 already. The problem is that we don't have an army of people doing that like we do an army of people for the development. Um, so when it comes down to people wanting better documentation, then write it is what it comes down to. If you want better documentation, write the documentation. Help others write the documentation. Indicate what needs to be written and then see who might be able to write it. Maybe it's something that you're interested in, you don't have enough documentation, learn enough about it, write the documentation so somebody else doesn't have to go through the same experience you had in trying to learn it. Um, it is an open source project and that includes the documentation. So everybody is responsible for it in the end as far as I'm concerned. Would I like to see better documentation? Yes. Would I like to see more examples of the real world? Yes, I'd love to see those. But we need to have those coming not just from my team. We need to have those coming from everybody who's working on the project. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I'll just add a writer there that if you um, feel that uh, you can contribute to the documentation, then feel free to mercilessly um, pester me in IRC or on Twitter or um, anywhere you see me in Zencon Europe or anywhere else um, about how to contribute. Um, it's not as daunting as you think. It's really very, very simple. If you understand Markdown, then you can contribute to the documentation. It's as simple as that. Um, so definitely come and find myself or any anyone else, I guess, in this chat. Probably not Matthew. He's got enough on his plate. But anyone else in the community who who can help you to, to, contrib to contribute to the documentation absolutely will spend uh, some time talking through how to do that. I mean, those contributions are always massively welcome. So, please do. Cool. One thing um, I would like to add. Ahead, sorry. Um, there have been several discussions. I mean, this this comes up uh, in the mailing list every once in a while, and there have been quite a few discussions about, um, you know, why does the documentation suck? What can we do to improve it? And um, they, we've even gone like pretty far in those discussions on the mailing list and talked about, you know, let's maybe think about setting up a formal docs team, um, like a, a real docs team, that, that that's what they do, kind of like PHP um, Internals actually has a docs team um, that, that is assigned to that. We've, we've had these discussions. The, the problem is um, simply, like Matthew said, is getting, getting the follow through, getting the commitment from people, getting um, the community interested enough. I mean, docs are not a sexy topic. They're not, not something that everybody likes to um, do necessarily. A lot of people, you know, we, we like to write code. We're programmers. We don't really like to write docs, but um, it's something that's got to get done. And um, I personally, I would like to see some follow through. Um, it's just we've there's got to be some people that, that have got to really step up and, um, you know, be superstars in the community and, and really help us out. Um, you know, Matthew's team can only be stretched so thin. They, they work on so much already, and there's only three of them. So it, it really does fall on the community to, to improve these types of things. So that's and all I wanted. Uh, I noticed that Marco and Ben are strangely quiet on the topic, topic of documentation. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, um, there's, there's an interesting uh, idea by Gary. Uh, so uh, the idea is to put a sandbox at version of PHP live on the documentation. That would be interesting because um, it's something that nobody has done so far. If anybody knows about sites like Evil or uh, sites like uh, CodePad.Viper7.org, I think, um, it's basically like an editor, a text editor, which allows you to edit some PHP code and throw it at so somewhere and you see the results. That would be very interesting for the documentation, but nobody has worked on it so far. And as said, there is a lot of effort to put in documentation in general, uh, but that would uh, help people actually get started with the framework. 
even by just typing in a page some examples, some code. Uh, so if anybody out there has already experienced building this stuff, this sort of stuff, this maybe is a less boring topic uh, we, because we're actually talking about building something really complex, which is this PHP sandbox. And that would help people uh, getting started with the framework much easier. Cool. So can you mark the best practices question, uh, Evan? Thanks. Um, so I guess we're um, slowly but surely running out of time. Um, so let me quickly check what questions there are. Oh, um, there's a question about benchmarking, and I'm just going to immediately poo poo that and say I don't care. I haven't read the post, but almost certainly the benchmarking of Hello World is just nonsense, so you shouldn't take those sites seriously at all. Um, and to that real yeah, quick. Yeah, I'm with it. Yeah. Um, the baseline performance benchmarks, I, I've, I've said this so many times, it's just, it feels redundant just saying it um, here, but um, those baseline performance uh, benchmarks, they, they do tell something. They, they do give you an indicator of, of baseline performance, and you can make that argument all day long. Um, that's true. But when you actually put something like Zen Framework 2 um, up against in a real-world application, um, any other PHP framework, uh, you're going to quickly find, and I can speak to uh, from experience on this on several very large-scale projects, um, that because of the way that things are architectured and the way that you can make use of the service manager and the event manager to do things on demand as they're needed, um, the performance of Zen Framework 2 actually starts to shine as your application gets more complex. So when you look at benchmarks, um, like what is probably linked, I, I'm not looking at that link right now or anything, but uh, you, need to, you need to keep that in mind because um, those those benchmarks are really only showing you that baseline. They're not showing you how the, perform the performance of the framework actually stands up against a real-world application. Yeah, cool. So um, I'll, take this, I'll take this last question if you guys are okay for time. Um, there's uh, another question by Kyle. Um, are there any modules that are candidates to replace the current ZF2 components? Um, and the subset of that question is, what's the process involved in getting a module moved into the core? So, you know, is there any any route to moving a module from community to core? Um, is, I guess that's the second part of the question. But the first is, are there any are there any um, candidates to replace current ZF2 uh, components with community modules or individual modules? Nobody. I haven't seen any at this point. Um, I know that uh, Ben has uh, talked about doing a new authentication uh, service and everything, but uh, I haven't seen it, so I don't know for sure what the status will be on that. Any uh, components that uh, are end up that way, basically, you know, you need to bring them up on the developer mailing list uh, so that we can discuss and uh, do inclusion on that. We have actually had a few come into ZF2 that way, where they were created. Uh, uh, as separate uh, component repositories, and then we uh, brought them into the uh, Zen framework. Some of them were brought in as separate component repositories and specific cases, uh, service components. Uh, these include the, the APNS and the GCM support um, and the Windows Phone uh, notification support. Those came in as uh, separate ones. There was a proposal on list. Uh, we brought the information in uh, as separate repositories. So basically, it all goes through the um, uh, the, the mailing list and uh, votes at that point to determine, you know, is it something that as a community we feel we can maintain? Um, you know, propose it is what it comes down to. Uh, I think there's, a, I'm getting told that there's a follow-up to the question in IRC. Oh, uh, Evan points out that the module manager actually started off as a module, uh, so that that is a good point as well, that uh, the module manager, even the MVC, started off as modules and eventually made it into core for Zen Framework 2, um, so that would be a possibility. We've talked about some of the stuff that we've done with um, uh, App Agility potentially coming into core. The problem is that those are have MVC integration, which makes them actually much better suited as modules. Uh, anything that we want to bring into the, the main library, we would likely need to be something that's standalone, uh, that isn't doing a whole lot of integration. It's really just doing this one thing itself. I know one of the pieces uh, that I've seen, uh, Kyle, who asked the question, is he's got an uh, up 
basically an upgrade to um, navigation. You know, any sort of uh, change like that where he's basically rewritten navigation, we would need to look and see what the backwards compatibility issues are with it. Um, do the old does the old code work with it? Uh, does it uh, modify things significantly? Does it add new features that are of benefit? Is it something that will actually improve the framework, or is it something that's uh, kind of you know we can still point people to that component if they want to use it? Uh, so those are the sort of discussions we have on the developer demand list. Cool. Yeah, I think I'll um, admit the um, ask that question for personal <laughs> for personal knowledge rather than for the greater good, but that's fine, Kai. Um, I guess um, we've covered all the, the user questions. I've got one last question for you guys. Um, uh, what do you envisage the timeline being for um, ZF3, I guess, Alpha, Beta, or any kind of release? So uh, we had originally targeted it being a uh, 18 to 24 months after a stable ZF2 release. So that puts us somewhere uh, in the second half of 2014 at this point. Uh, part of that is going to depend on us uh, actually finalizing what the feature set is going to be and setting up those milestones. Uh, so you know, it may be a little bit longer. It may be exactly on time. We'll see. I don't anticipate it happening before then, however, because we don't have uh, any significant momentum yet. Um, we're starting to get more and more pull requests that are discussing potential uh, features or changes, uh, which is great, but we're, we haven't actually made any commitments to them. Uh, so that's something that we need to be starting to do in the next few months is uh, ironing down, you know, what are those, what are we going to be doing for ZF3 so that we can come up with the milestones and then from there uh, an actual concrete timeline. But I, I would look to say, you know, no earlier than the second half of next year. Is there any coincidence um, that Zencom is in October or is that... No, that just uh, happened. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, actually, it's funny. Um, Zen Framework 2, we actually uh, launched at the end of August last year. It was before ZenCon. Um, and that was, I'm sorry, I've got a phone ringing in the background, and I can't reach it easily, so I'm not going to. Um, but uh, yeah, we actually were able to launch it before ZenCon last year. Uh, and actually, that's the ideal situation for us because uh, getting. Uh, the conference ready and the uh, you know our materials for the conference and uh, release is uh, an absolute nightmare. Uh, so you know if we do uh, target that time frame, we want to have it either about a month before or a month after, most likely, uh, so that we don't kill kill ourselves in trying to get the release ready. Um, so that that's how things work. ZenCon has always been uh, in on, uh, September or October every year. Uh, that is kind of a nice built-in deadline for getting releases out, uh, but like I said, it's also kind of crazy to have a release timed for the same uh, time frame as ZenCon itself, just because yeah. you, you end up killing yourself is what it comes down to. <laughs> ben, any, any uh, ETA on the, I guess the router will be available, the updated router will be available for people to play with um, shortly. Um, yes, I plan to get a prototype done until the endcon Europe, so I can actually make an uncon talk there about it. Um, but, uh, well, I don't really know if I can actually get it done until then, because it requires some benchmarking. I really want to improve the performance of it a lot. I mean, it already got better with Zen Framework 2, but there's still room to improve it. Cool. So is there anything else you guys want to add before we wrap this up? Um, I just want to add a couple uh, closing notes. Um, we do intend to do these um, hangouts semi-regularly. They will probably not um, be this long uh, going on uh, moving forward. Um, but if there are any, like, there's probably a few unanswered questions um, that, that we didn't have time to get to. Um, but what we're going to be able to do is, um, as we go on and, and do more of these hangouts, we'll, we'll kind of focus in on specific topics um, and, like, the specific changes that have uh, happened over the course of the last week or two weeks since we we lasted a hangout. Um, I can't promise that we'll always have Matthew here on uh, every hangout, but uh, we'll at least bug him uh, to see if he can make appearances every once in a while. Um, so yeah, this is uh, something that should be pretty regular. If you want to be notified of when we're going to do them, follow Rove Team, R-O-A-V-E Team on Twitter. Um, that's the original account that actually announced this in the beginning. So, um, But that's basically it. I want to say thanks to everyone, especially Matthew, for making time to do this. And um, yeah. I'll thanks let you close it out, Gary. Um, um, if I may add something. 
Yeah, go for it. If there's anybody out there, join us on IRC. We're always there uh, on ZF Talk and ZF Talk Dev. Especially if you're interested in new features, if you have good ideas, if you're unsatisfied with something, or if you think that what we're saying here is wrong, just ping us, let us know, and especially on IRC, we're always there, and we will probably try to help you or get uh, get you somewhere with your questions. And thank you. Yeah. Oh, and also something very important to point out is that these Hangouts are not um, meetings for decision making or anything like that. These are purely uh, informational, just to help you guys um, follow uh, the development of Zen Framework 3. Um, Zen Framework is an open source community project, so decisions, actual decisions, are made by the community, um, not by us um, or even Matthew or his team. It's it's a community project. So um, these Hangouts are just strictly meant to help you guys be able to easily uh, follow the development of Zen Framework 3 and nothing else. So Thank you very much. So I guess it just leaves me to wrap up. Um, I think the um, five of us will be at ZenCon in a fortnight's time in Paris, in ZenCon Europe, so feel free to um, come up and, and we can try and get a discussion going if, if there's enough um, interest in ZenCon Europe to get a discussion on this topic going, then I'm sure all, all five and, and anyone else of the contributors who are in the ZF Talk Dev channel would be more than happy to do that. Um, the resources for keeping up to date, I'll just run through them. They've been covered, I think, all of them have, but I'll quickly run through them. So there's the um, the mailing list, the Zen, contri uh, Zen Framework Contributors mailing list. There's the, um, the Zen Framework 2 issue tracker that Marco pointed out, which is in GitHub, um, and the Zen Framework 3 BC wiki. That's in GitHub as well, Marco? Where's that wiki located? Yeah, there's a wiki page on the Zen Framework page, uh, Zen Framework repository that contains the BC Brex, and you can see the Zen Framework 3 issues by searching the open issues. Thank you. And there's a Google moderator, um, which I'll link to in uh, IRC and tweet out after this. And uh, any feedback that you can leave for us um, on what you'd like to see in these Hangouts or um, in uh, if you'd like more formal um, uh, IRC meetings like we had during Zen from 2 development, then please, um, we're all yours, and we'd love to hear anything you guys have got to say. So thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.